Good morning, everyone. Praise God. Once again, he's awakened us, given us a new opportunity to walk on this earth in faith, knowing that he is God and he is in control of all things. Praise be to God, for he is worthy of all praise. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this morning acknowledging that you are God and that there is none above you. We worship you, Father, and praise you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. By grace, you have saved us through faith in your son Jesus Christ who died on the cross at Calvary to pay the sin debt that we could not pay. We walk this earth in sin and we repent Father. Help us to understand your will and your ways and to grow in the knowledge of your light so that we might light the path for others to see the goodness of you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for giving us wisdom and knowledge so that we might grow in our relationship with you. And in Jesus' name, I thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. This week's lesson is titled, Hannah, Devoted to God. And our daily devotional is titled, Samson's Cry for Vengeance, from the book of Judges, chapter 16, verses 23 through 31. And it says, Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God, and to rejoice, for they said, our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy, and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, that they called, or oh, they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport, and they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me, that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about three thousand men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson uncalled, called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the Lord's and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than there were which he slew in his life. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshalom, the burying place of Manoah, his father, and he judged Israel twenty years. God 
hears your prayers. He's listening. He really is. Okay, Hannah, devoted to God. The central truth of the lesson is that God hears and answers the earnest prayers of his people. The focus is to examine how God answered Hannah's prayer and persist in prayer. The evangelism emphasis is that Christians are called to intercede for the lost. The golden text says, Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about, Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And that's from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 20. Genuine prayer involves more than simply nodding our head in consent as someone prays within our hearing. It requires much more than saying common words and patterns. Those of us who have been brought up in church and regularly attend worship services can easily find ourselves relying on prayer words and patterns which may not flow from deep within a heart of commitment and adoration. Hannah provides us with an example of consistent, sincere prayer over a period of time. She did not pray for her need and desire for a short period of time and then only occasionally mention it. Unlike Hannah, however, we can become inconsistent in prayer. Why? First, ongoing prayer is work. It takes time and effort. Second, our spiritual adversary attempts to discourage our efforts, suggesting it is an exercise in futility. Third, the length of time praying for a request with no seeming response may cause us to assume God's answer is no. This lesson provides us with an example of how God may choose to respond to our urgent, persistent praying. It also teaches us not to allow circumstances to hinder our confidence in God as we pray. Hannah did not allow anyone to place a roadblock in her seeking the Lord to change her circumstances in answer to her ongoing requests. The central truth of the lesson reminds us God hears and answers earnest prayers. He does not obligate himself to flippant, half-hearted, occasional inquiries concerning his provision and intervention on our behalf. Through God's grace and mercy, he calls us into a loving, strong relationship, which will be evidenced and nurtured in our praying. In some settings, we may repeat by memory a prayer such as the Lord's Prayer, or we might offer a familiar prayer of thanks before eating a meal. Each of these may serve as a genuine expression to God provided we pray with a sincere heart. All right, section one, Hannah's plight, barren womb. First Samuel chapter one, verses one through five. It says, now there was a certain man of Ramathabophon of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elikah, the son of Jeram the son of Elhu, the son of Tua, the son of Zephu, and Eparite. Ep and he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Piranha. And Piranha had children, but Hannah had no children. 
And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Philhas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elikah offered, he gave to Purana, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord has shut up her womb. Once again, Scripture records the extraordinary account of a special birth to a barren womb. Earlier examples are Sarah and Isaac, Rebecca and her twins, and Rachel's delayed conception of Joseph. In all these cases, the children played a specific part in redemptive history. Hannah's son, Samuel, may have been the most influential of all. The narrative of this divine provision of a son begins with a brief description of the family. The father is Elikah, a descendant of Levi's son, Korhat. This qualified Samuel to serve in a priestly role along with being a judge and prophet. This family lived in the city of Ramah, in the tribal territory of Ephraim. Further information indicates a polygamous marriage. God fully intended for marriage to be one man and one, man, one woman. Matthew 19 verses 4 through 6. Unsurprisingly, all of the polygamous relationships recorded in scripture indicate strife and contention. Jacob had his two wives, Rachel and Leah are one example. And that's in Genesis chapter 30. Both Elkanah and Hannah were devoted individuals. Every year he took his family to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice. Each wife was given provisions to offer personal offerings. Verse 5 points to a loving relationship between Elkanah and Hannah. His love for her was not based on her conceiving children. This is significant since barrenness was commonly viewed as resulting from the woman's having committed some sin for which God was punishing her. Furthering Hannah's plight of being barren, barren was the second wife in the family, Penela who had borne children to Elkahah. Verse 3 introduces Eli, the high priest, and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Eli was old and had failed to discipline his unruly sons. Even upon being warned by God, in Genesis no, Judges 3.13. They desecrated the priestly office with immorality and improper patterns of sacrifice. Okay, section 1b. Provocative rival. First Samuel chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. It says, And her adversary also pervert her sore, for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elka, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better? to thee that ten sons? Penaos 
true character readily became obvious. Apparently, she continued to plague Hannah concerning her barrenness in contrast to bearing children for her husband. This harassing behavior continued year after year, especially when they went to Shiloh to worship. We could see this as a form of spiritual as well as emotional abuse. It is little wonder Hannah wept and lost her appetite. The cruelty and the delight Hanana apparently received from this behavior can be seen in verse 6. She must have delighted in seeing the misery of Hannah. Elkah did what he could to soothe and comfort his wife. The series of four questions appear as genuine inquiry, but one wonders, could he have been so blind to what was taking place? Regretfully, many men are somewhat hindered in their emotional understanding of women and the desire to have their own children. The last question, don't I mean more to you than ten sons, is different from the first three. Apparently, Elka could not grasp how devastating it was for Hannah to be barren and then undergo the constant demeaning by Pina. There's an insert here titled Conflict and Combat. It says conflict is inevitable, but combat is optional. That's by Max Lucado. When you face a trial like Hannah was facing, it's important to pray, to draw close to the Lord, to open your heart to God and allow Him to hear what you're feeling. God has feelings too, he understands. And so, in times like these, it's imperative that we not seek comfort from any other source than our, our creator, God. Draw near to him. He's our comfort. I thank you for your time this morning. Pray this lesson has encouraged you to draw close to God. He's there for you, wanting to have a relationship with you that's beneficial to your life and to your peace and joy. Have a wonderful Monday.